Well, hello everybody. Welcome back into the Colored Gemstone Academy. I am your instructor, Paul DC, and this is my YouTube channel, Paul DC Gemstones. Now, as always, I really do appreciate each and every one of you who have subscribed me at the time of this taping. We have surpassed 800 subscribers steaming our way on to 900. So if you can subscribe, I would appreciate it. Remember, it's completely free. It doesn't cost you a penny. And uh, also share with your friends. Get them to subscribe as well. Well, I'm, I'm actually doing this broadcast from my backyard or from my balcony on the intercoastal waterway, so you may occasionally hear some splashing, you might hear some boats going by, but that just adds to the ambiance. Well, today's lesson is very near and dear to my heart. I think it's one of the most underrated, underpriced gemstones on planet Earth, and it is called marcasite. Marcasite. Hmm. I would say that most arguably, marcasite has the most bling for the buck of any gemstone. And what do I mean by bling for the buck? I know that we have uh, viewers from all over the world, including China and Australia and India and all over the place. Well, here in the United States, we call our dollar sometimes a buck. Bling is something that sparkles, so it's really one of the most sparkly pieces of jewelry you can get for the price. That's what I mean by bling for the buck. I also know that there are always purists who are watching this show who are trying to catch me in some sort of dispute or try and catch me for saying something that isn't really true. Because technically, when I talk about marcasite jewelry, it's not even marcasite at all. I know, that that's, sounds crazy, right? So what is marcasite? Most marcasite is actually what's known as white iron pyrite. Okay, so what's the difference? What's the difference between marcasite and wine iron, white iron pyrite? I thought they were one and the same thing. Actually, marcasite and white iron pyrite are what we call a polymorph. That means they have the same exact chemical composition, but something happens during the formation, whether it's heat and pressure and other things, that makes it a slightly different gemstone altogether. So in the case of the uh, marcasite, its crystal structure is called orthorhombic. In the case of white iron pyrite, the crystal structure is called cubic. So they have two different crystal structures. So now I know what your next question probably is. If they have essentially the same chemical composition but different, different crystal structures, why don't we just use marcasite instead of white iron pyrite to make our marcasite jewelry? Well, the reason is this. When a uh, marcasite is exposed to moisture, it can cause a reaction that creates um, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid, bad. <laughs> we don't want to be wearing sulfuric acid, or even as, as you're working with the stone and grinding it, you don't want to ingest fumes that have sulfuric acid. So what they actually use is white iron pyrite, which is less brittle, than, so more durable than the marcasite, and it doesn't react and create sulfuric acid. Okay, I think we can all agree on that. But for the purposes of this lesson, we all still refer to it as marcasite jewelry. So for the rest of this lesson, when I, talk, when I say marcasite, I'm talking about white iron pyrite. Okay, so this is about marcasite. So let's talk about some of those sort of boring things that I talk about that help you identify what a gemstone, what makes a gemstone a gemstone, okay? So the chemical composition is iron sulfide. So whether you're talking about the marcasite or the white iron pyrite, again, when I talk about marcasite for the rest of the show, it's white iron pyrite, um, it's iron sulfide. The crystal structure, as I mentioned, of marcasite is orthorhombic, but the white iron pyrite, which creates all, almost all the marcasite jewelry, is cubic. That means it's like a square. And you actually see in the formation on some of the, the pictures that I show you, it looks like little squares of, in this case it looks like silver, in the case of a different type of pyrite, which I'll get to in a minute. It's called fool's gold. Okay, so the uh, hardness, between six and six and a half, that's pretty good. It puts it almost there in the neighborhood between the opal and the uh, uh, quartz. So it's pretty good for everyday wear. Toughness is considered poor, but now remember that's really the marcasite 
remembering that white iron pyrite, which is the polymorph, which is where most of the marxite jewelry comes from, is a little bit more, less brittle, so a little bit more durable than the poor rating of the marcasite stone. Refractive index, again, that's, that talks to the sparkle of the gemstone, is between 1.65 and 1.91. Now, to put that into perspective, a diamond is going to be 2.42. So it has a really highly refractive surface, but it's not going to sparkle like a diamond. Except, I'll tell you why, it's something different a little bit later. The specific gravity. Now remember, when we talk about the specific gravity, we're talking about the heft of the gemstone. Um, and it's pretty big. This one, I mean, pretty heavy. So it's going to be between 4.95 and 5.1. Now you might say, yeah, that's pretty heavy. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, more dense than, say, a sapphire, which is four on the most, I um, mean, on the specific gravity scale. So what does that mean to you? If you had an equal piece, like a, what was a one carat uh, uh, marcasite stone and a one carat sapphire, the marcasite would actually be heavier, even though it would be you know, so it's going to be a little smaller to look at than the sapphire, but it would actually be the same weight. So I hope I, I hope I and if you if you get confused by that, I do have a lesson that talks specifically about some of these things like specific gravity in some, one of my gemology lessons. Okay, now if the name pyrite sounds familiar to you. Well, there's another variety that isn't the white iron pyrite, but more the yellow iron pyrite, which was known affectionately by miners in the early days of mining as fool's gold. Because people that were panning for gold in rivers and streams in the west of part of the United States, they would get uh, happen upon something that looked like this, and you see it on your screen, it looks a little bit like gold, and it even felt pretty heavy. Remember I said that specific gravity? up to like 5.91, so it feels pretty heavy. So they think, wow, I struck gold. How do we know it's not gold? Well, you can test a lot of different things, obviously, to find out that it's iron sulfide and not gold. But more importantly, the specific gravity of gold is over 19. I think it's a 19.32, I think is the exact specific gravity. So gold is so dense, it would feel like four times as heavy as that fool's gold or yellow iron pyrite would be. Now also marcasite, historically, and I haven't shown you one yet, except on the screen. I have some of Judy's um, collection of this marcasite, which I wanted you to see. And here's a, an example of a bracelet set with some crystals in there as well. Uh, here's a great shot also alternating some of the marcasite stones with these white crystals or white uh, quartz, white topaz, things like that. Marcasite is sometimes referred to as the European black diamond. Now why? Because when you looked at it from a distance it could sparkle just like a diamond but obviously it didn't have the whiteness of a, of a, a diamond. And the use of marcasite first became popular in the Victorian era in Europe. And when we talk about the Victorian era, as they were talking about the time in Europe under the reign of Queen Victoria. Now Queen Victoria's husband died in the 1800s and there was, it was customary in that time to have a period of mourning the loss of her husband. So basically black was the fashion of the day. Okay, let's be real. It wasn't like in the late 1800s fashions were all that colorful or bright anyway. But in any event, it was customary to wear black to mourn the loss of Queen Victoria's husband. Um, <clears throat> so because of so much darker colors being worn, something became very, very popular at that time, which would be taking black jet. Jet is a form of fossilized coal. I talk about that in another uh, lesson. But black jet set in stainless steel was sort of the most popular jewelry of the day. Well, that has evolved today into marcasite, 
set in a sterling cell. Okay, so how is the marcasite cut or faceted like we think about gems today? Well, most marcasite historically was a round stone faceted on six different sides around that round stone. And so when you think about that, <coughs> where you have that kind of flat surface of marcasite, but faceted in six different directions, if you had a, a necklace or a piece of jewelry that had a hundred marcasite stones in there, each with six facets, you're talking about 600 facets. That's why from a distance it could look just like a darker looking diamond. And that was really kind of the way that it was for most of the history of Marcusite. I remember when I started as a host at the home shopping club back in the late 1980s, and of course now it's called HSN, but it's called the home shopping club back then, and I would tell a lot of Marcusite on the air. And I started to notice a brand new cut suddenly appearing in the late 18, uh, 1980s, and it was, here, I'm going to show you. It's in, it's in my book, ironically. But do you see this uh, Marcusite piece right here, where you see all of these round cuts, and then the, you see what looks like to be four pyramids set in the center of that piece of jewelry. Well, that was developed by the Swarovski Company. Now, those of you that have heard of Swarovski crystals, they pioneered a new technique in cutting the Marcusite which was a square cut with four faceted sides, and it looks just like a pyramid. I happen to really like um, the one that I just showed you. I like uh, Mark's Eye Jewelry that will have both of them in, in one piece of jewelry. So you see the traditional round cuts kind of alternating with some of those pyramid cuts. I think it's really a beautiful, completely different, uh, different way. Um, but this is also, a, a kind of brings up an interesting point. Most of your marcasite has a very antique look to it, which bring, is going to bring you some, to some very important points about care and cleaning. Most marcasite is set in silver that has already been oxidized. In other words, when you leave sterling silver, out in the elements. Over time, it's going to tarnish. We've all seen that. Actually, this is a great example of that. Uh, this, this is a piece that was sil sterling silver, and notice it's become much, much darker, almost a pewter color. And if we look at the back, you can see more of the tarnishing that has happened on that piece of jewelry. Well, a lot of marcasite that is made even today, they will pre-tarnish the jewelry. They call it oxidized silver to give it more of that authentic, antique look. So when I talk about care and cleaning of your marcasite, there's two things that you have to keep in mind. Number one, um, don't use any silver cleaner to clean the silver where your marcasite is set. And the reason I don't recommend that, it's going to make that silver look completely different and it won't look like the antique piece. And one of the great things about marcasite jewelry, it looks better the longer you wear it and the longer you own it. So that's number one. Number two, most of your marcasite stones are set into the setting using a jeweler's adhesive rather than prongs or channel set like you'll see with a lot of other typical transparent gemstones. So I don't recommend also soaking your marcasite in liquids or cleaning solutions for an extended period of time because over time it might break down that jeweler's adhesive. Now don't worry. You know, some of you say, well, what happens if the stone does happen to fall out? I get that question all of the time. I would have never said this before, but there's a, a gentleman by the name of Steve Harper who had uh, a Native American jewelry manufacturing uh, plant in, in Gallup, New Mexico for years and years and years. He had some of the best inlay I've ever seen, and he was telling me when he was showing how strong his inlay was, I said, what are you using for the jeweler's adhesive? He said, super glue. So if you have a stone that falls out, a little dab of super, super glue, put it back on. If it's good enough for Steve Harper, it's good enough for me, and it should be good enough for you. Okay, so one last thing about what is the um, antique nature of the Marcusite jewelry. 
Well, if you're buying marcasite jewelry, remember I talked about in the late 1980s when they had that pyramid Kyle Stott developed, developed by Swarovski? Um, if you're buying something that's being, that somebody's telling you is 100 years old, an antique piece of marcasite jewelry, and if it has that square cut marcasite in there, that can't be more than, say, 35 years old at, the, at best because that cut of marcasite wasn't even available until the late 1980s. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Again, I really think it is one of the most underpriced, underrated bling gemstones in the entire world. So do, do yourself a favor, shop for some marcasite. So that's gonna do it for this week's edition of the Color Gemstone Academy. Remember, if you've not yet done so, please hit that subscribe button. You can also hit a notification bell so every time that I have a new video, you will be notified and you won't miss a thing. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Everybody.